because of the small age I've spoken to, because that's all right. Um, I did a poetry gig about 10 years ago in a pub at a lunchtime, and there were three people there, and I wanted to try sandwiches, so I went. <laughs> so, um, the context of my presentation. So, I'm doing a PhD in the Information School at the University of Sheffield. And it's about gatekeepers, values, and flows of various kinds in research sharing infrastructure. In research sharing, sharing infrastructure, sorry, which is the name I've given to the various platforms and systems that are being used um, <coughs> to share information and outputs from their research. In part because infrastructure implies that it's a practice and it implies that there are people involved, whereas systems and platforms don't necessarily include that. I'm looking at the different workflows of researchers and the librarians and the platforms themselves, um, the data that flows between all of these things, the money flows and the power flows, and how open the research flows connect to the platform economy. So there's a lot in common in terms of who funds them and where they're connected to. So, data foam. Um, I'm trying to make it a thing. It is a bit like trying to make fetch happen. Mean girls. Not many um, <laughs> um, but I wanted to explain what I felt about some of the things that were coming out in my research. So it's I use foam because foam is what's created when you agitate something. You agitate water like the sea, which is where my bloody rubbish drawings come from. Um, it implies that there's friction involved. And friction can be both good and bad, so you get you look at Paul Edwards' use of friction, but you also look at Anna Singh's use of friction, and she talks about friction being a productive tension. And I quite like words that have got more than one meaning, so agitation also has more than one meaning, which I'll come to later. But for me, foam is this layer that sits on top of the various data flows and journeys, which is what Joan talks about in her work, which complicates the idea of flows as a smooth, free-running thing. And it may be of dubious value, so I, didn't, I choose not to use the word skull, because that's a bit <laughs> that's a bit too political, even though I'm quite political and political in my work. Um, but quite often, the, it, there's an opportunity for vendors to create new products that are really solutions in search of problems. And we see a lot of that in this space um, around the platform economy. But in the area that I'm looking at, which is obviously scholarly communications and the research cycle, the way that uh, vendors are now making money is changing because they used to make money out of content, out of content, out of supplying content, out of licensing content, big academic publishers, um, and the new, the new uh, entrance to the field coming along. Um, but can't really make money out of open access. Well, they are now, but this is like the dying days of the CD, <laughs> the music industry tried to cream as much money out of, out of the industry as it could back in sort of 2000 and then obviously now most people get their music for free and it's only people at the top of the pile that make money. So people like Elsevier and Digital Science and new players who end up being bought by Elsevier and Digital Science create these new products that nobody knew they actually needed and they probably don't actually need but people above them in the food chain end up buying them. So things like new forms of metrics, uh, things like online research and notebooks and stuff like that, and new ways of ranking and measuring people as part of datification. And the other reason I use phone is because of Slow Dyke's idea of phone, that there are all these social phones, these cells that are connected, but they're independent from each other, they sit next to each other. So, right, this is another bit of explaining my title. <laughs> um, so, when I talk about end-to-end, -end, it's because that's the way that the big suppliers in scholarly communication describe what they want to do. They say they want to capture all parts of the research cycle. They don't call it capture, they say it's helping you. So, uh, Digital Science, who are owned by Spring and Nature, the big publishers, they have products like Figshare, Altmetrics, Simplectic, they've supported version of Vivo. And they said recently on one of their blogs, we want to help you with research data management, we want to help you with finding funders, we want to help you with assessing your research, we want to help you with 
sharing your data, all of that kind of thing. Um, so we want to help you at every stage of the research process and every player in the research process. So the people who work on finance, the people who work on student data, the people who work on uh, recruitment. And Elsevier have done a very similar thing. Uh, they have bought up various products and developed new products of their own to capture various parts of the research cycle. And that has led to consolidation by these massive academic publishers. So you used to have the big deal in libraries, in academic libraries, where instead of subscribing to individual journals, uh, in the past sort of 10, 15 years, academic libraries have been buying into big deals, big bundle deals of content, some of which their users use, some of which they don't. And those big deals are sort of dying out because the prices have become absolutely unaffordable. Even Harvard, who have the richest library in the world, can't afford to subscribe to all the resources that their researchers want them to subscribe to. And um, Canada's quite an interesting case for looking at how much these things cost because you actually have transparency here on what people are paying for things. In the UK, everything's done by negotiated via disk collections. You can't find out who's downloading what unless you have a specific s subscription and you have the, the power within your university to do that. So if an individual wanted to campaign against this, they couldn't actually find out how much their institution was paying for most of these things unless somebody's released the data, which people have been trying to get them to do. Stuart Lawson's been looking at this, trying to find out how much money people have been paying out to these publishers. But it's actually quite difficult. Whereas, whereas here, then institutions have been sharing how much they've been paying out for these big deals and how they're going to stop. So obviously, these, these big publishers know that with open access and open data, eventually, there's just not going to be the same level of profit in content. Just as we've seen in journalism, just as we've seen in music, the content's not what's going to make you the money. So they have to make, they have to make a difference making their money out of these, capturing these different bits of the research cycle instead by moving from products to services. But originally, all of the services that were developed in this scholarly communication space, all of these research sharing infrastructures, were scholar-led, things like archive, uh, repair, not SSRN, because they were always a for-profit company even before else had been bought them. And they were decentralized. You had institutional repositories and loads of different institutions. You had loads of different disciplinary repositories and preprint servers. You had lots of different social platforms, ResearchGate, Academia, um, Mendeley, before they got bought by Elsevier. <laughs> and they were social. So the reason why archives started is because um, when the internet started, high energy physicists were the people who kind of first got it and computer scientists and they wanted to share their research. So they were emailing it to each other and then they were like, this is inefficient, let's just stick it on an FTP server. And that's how all of these preprint servers came about and they were just scholars sharing with each other. And when Academia and ResearchGate started, they were founded by people who had PhDs, four scholars to share with each other, they were following each other. It wasn't really necessarily about self-branding at that point. It wasn't necessarily about being instrumental. It was about people doing what they've always done, which is sharing their research with each other within disciplinary communities and within communities of interest. And the infrastructure was distributed, which meant that it was not something that people could take over. And the institutional repositories in most institutions, certainly in the UK and Europe, the situation's a bit different in the US and Canada because you don't have the same mandates that we have. Um, you don't have the EU, probably we're going to have the EU, uh, <laughs> Which is sad. Um, but, um, try to get through all So we had all of these open source systems. And then some new, not just new products came about that, that the big academic publishers wanted to sell, but some other influences came about. So funders in the UK, um, the research councils started demanding open access, and they wanted that to be monitored so they could work out whether people complied with mandates. The UK government, via HEFKI, our funding council for higher education, 
said, right, everything has to be put in the, in the institutional repository as of last, April last year, within, well, on the day of acceptance, but ideally within three months of acceptance. And so people who weren't the scholars, and people who weren't the library, and who didn't have values that were necessarily to do with helping people, and were more to do with controlling people, decided, well, we need more stuff to audit this, we need more stuff to control this, we need to find out more data about this, because everybody loves numbers. Everybody wants metrics about it, so there's new metrics. And they all bought into that and went above people's head and centralised it. And one of the points I want to make, which is on my slide, because you know, I don't like reading out slides, I'm sort of doing it a bit today, because I know there's a few people in the room, um, is that people talk about a lot when they're, they talk about how academic publishers are evil, and sometimes I will say that, because I hate most of it, and they know I do. Um, but it's not really about them owning your data. So the, pe the research officers who are buying these products, and the senior administrators, administrators who are buying these products, say, well, we still own our data. We still own our outputs, and the point is, it's not really about whether you own the content or the data, it's about who's controlling the flows of the data, who owns the flows of the data, because data brokers are actually the biggest players in 4IR, which is the fourth industrial revolution, the revolution where the economy is based on data. Our lives are controlled by data brokers, so it doesn't matter that Cambridge Analytica don't own the data about you. It matters that they control what happens to you. It's just an excuse for me to quote before we go. Um, power on the money power for the power. I'm not going to recite all this. So this is a thing that I call the access of evil, <laughs> which I quite enjoy. Um, and it's showing um, it's showing various players within the space of research and the platform economy and how they're related to each other in terms of money. I have started mapping uh, where it goes in terms of power and influence as well and who lobbies who, but that's much more complicated to do. So as you can see that there's Trump in there, except for Um But actually a lot of things are connected by Peter Thiel a lot of things are connected by Trump because of who funds what. So there's no real purity in academia. If you look at who's funding your academic pension, I don't know about in North America but in the, or in the rest of Europe, but in the UK you can look up and see who the academic pensions are funded by at any time. You can see where their biggest equities are and it's usually got Elsevier, well, Relax, which is Elsevier, really high up, which has got Facebook, which has got Alphabet, which is Google, which usually got Royal Dutch Shell, which is a big oil company. Peter Thiel has money in Facebook, we know that. Peter Thiel gives money to Trump. Peter Thiel has money in Lyft. Peter Thiel has money in all sorts of other things. Um, Peter Thiel also gets money from Elsevier, because Elsevier have a venture capital arm that funds Palantir who are doing the Muslim registry and the virtual wall building for the US government. There is no purity in this space. If you look at all of the connections on here, everything's connected. Um, LexisNexis is a big part of the Elsevier company. And LexisNexis you might think of in terms of legal resources, if you're a legal academic. But they're also a data broker. They provide those information for the health insurance industry. They provide information to the police in terms of predictive policing. They collect together lots of publicly, information, publicly collected information from the councils and from the government and also open data and put it together with proprietary data so that a, a cop standing on the street with their phone can instantly find out an awful lot of stuff about you that you would consider them not to know. And that includes from academic stuff. And there are other reasons why the platform economy and scholarly communication have a lot in common, not just the connections of money and power, because the people who are most precarious suffer most. So you can opt out of services if you're, you can kind of go, oh, I'm not really going to do audit culture, I'm not really going to do being on research gate in academia because they commodify me. I'm not going to engage with alt metrics. I don't want to engage with Twitter and Facebook because I, I want to control what happens to my stuff. You can do that if you're senior. 
But if you're a precarious worker in the scholarly economy, then you have to be seen. You have to be out there. If people can't find you, they can't give you work. That's all. Uh, if people can't find you, they can't give you work. So you do have to be on these services. Or if you don't, you have to find another way of being productive. And all the time, in terms of who funds what in these infrastructures, they're always funding start-up costs, and they're not funding maintenance, and they're not funding labour costs. And labour is what matters, and labour is invisible. So who holds the power? Back in the day, it was the Library for Institutional Infrastructures. They had the Institutional Repository. They had the Data Repository. They controlled the research information systems. And researchers had their own personal and social infrastructures. And now everything's about compliance, certainly in the UK context, and it's becoming more so in other countries. I know that in the US and Canada, more and more institutions have been buying into Pure, which is a system that's owned by Elsevier, or Symplectic, which is a system that's owned by Digital Science. And that's all about pitting researchers against each other, departments against each other, finding out what you've got and how you can control it. The research office and senior administrators and vendors and regulatory entrepreneurs who will change the law to see what they want. They're the ones who hold the power. So as I said earlier, agitation works more than one way. So the library has no power in this. People keep moaning that the library shouldn't buy these systems. The library isn't buying these systems anymore, it's a research office. PhD students and postdocs and other precarious scholars cannot fight this because they can't. I, I would like to fight it, I can only really fight it because my work's about it. I'm sure it will lead to me not being employed, but never mind. Unions can fight this because labour is important and senior academics can and should fight this. So, yeah, you can't opt out of your pension really unless you're an idiot. But what you can do is you can go to, the, you can go to these meetings when they're tendering the systems and say this actually works against our values. You can talk to your unions. It's really important that you do this. I don't really like resistance because resistance is futile. The evil empire will fight back. But refusal is powerful. I say never use Uber. Uber are dying now because people have realised how awful they are. Pick your battles, obviously, and not the people with the money, because Elsevier are with robbing people with the money all the time. If you look at the US and EU stuff that's online, the databases are online, you can see how much money they spend on lobbying every year, and we're not doing that. The unions aren't doing that. Across the world, we're not. assume that I would be the, uh, the odd person out in this panel that might have probably wouldn't fit in quite as well, but I think we'll see some connections, I think, especially with um, what Penny was talking about, um, the, the sort of big data flows in, in higher education uh, and research, and as you'll see here, I'm, I'm um, <clears throat> especially going to discuss and I'm concerned with uh, data flows in, in just sort of a narrower set of research, and an even narrower set as they get further into this where I think we might have some traction for getting started with dealing with these issues. So, um, both for-profit and not-for-profit organizations increasingly use big data not only to study what has happened, right, data analytics, but also to make, to predict future trends, predictive analytics. And with certain notable exceptions, for example, student recruitment in U.S. institutions and compulsive evaluations of research productivity in the U.K. and Australia, Academia, uh, I would argue, has generally lagged behind other sectors of society and its use of big data. One domain that has moved halfway into collecting and analyzing big data is scholarly publishing, whose stakeholders of varying size include libraries and other research institutions, learned societies, for-profit publishers, and not-for-profit publishers. So today I'm going to speak about a vision for a cooperative whose members would be those stakeholders these member organizations would work together to do more with big data than any of them could do on their own. And I'll certainly be interested to hear uh, your questions and maybe skepticism of this vision. So our work on this began at the uh, 2015 Scholarly Communication Institute held each October in the Research Triangle area of North Carolina. Um, if you're interested in the transformation of scholarly communication, the changes in the ways that researchers share their research with each other, uh, I highly recommend that you consider participating Call for proposals is issued each uh, early each year for projects involving three to eight people uh, who spend a few uh, spend time for a few days in North Carolina working on their project and interacting with other teams working on their own projects. Um, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation fully funds this multi-day retreat. Uh, it's well structured to enable collaboration within and across teams. 
Uh, the organizers look favorably on proposals that involve people who are geographically dispersed and therefore couldn't collaborate easily on their own. So a few tips about a future uh, application. Anyway, back to the vision that I'm presenting you today. Um, when I say uh, big data and scholarly publishing, what exactly am I talking about here? So this is not data sets created by researchers, the sort of supplementary data that might go along with a published paper or book or something. Um, and really not, more broadly speaking, other types of research outputs sometimes grouped together under research data. So not data sets, tabular data, and not other types of maybe non-textual data. But I'm talking about big data about published research. <clears throat> what kind of big data about published research? Data generated by publishers and aggregators of content. For example, purchasing data. <clears throat> Excuse me, purchasing data, licensing data, online usage data or web analytics, and subject classification of products. A few examples here in each of those categories. But also uh, data from research institutions, library data, um, structured productivity data that might be captured in an online faculty CV system, um, of which there are many terms, though the world hasn't sort of agreed on the term, but, but these, these things exist and we call them by many different names and they are all very similar in that they are, loosely speaking, an online faculty CV system that you have to record all of your work in, or records it for you. Um, but also, um, data from third parties, for example, from bibliometric services, uh, and from social networking sites, uh, just some examples here. So, um, you know, all of these, like other forms of big data, can be used for various types of assessment, uh, but also for predict, uh, predictive analytics. For example, which publications are most likely to be purchased, used, and cited. So gathering, integrating, interpreting, and reporting data about published research takes a lot of time and expertise. It's not something that many publishers and libraries, especially smaller nonprofit ones, have a lot of. These publishers and libraries struggle to identify, much less predict, important usage trends and opportunities through which they might extend their impact. But it's not just um, the, it's not just that data collection and analytics are expensive. There are also concerns about the use of analytics by those who can afford to collect and analyze the data. So to make this easier to understand, let's start with the concerns with use of predictive analytics by the retail industry, which we're all familiar with to some extent. So I use retail here as a general category for the sorts of things people most often associate with big data aside from government surveillance. Well, community here is actually probably a bit more familiar with this than other audiences that I've, I've delivered this to. But for example, which products are currently being purchased and which are most likely to be uh, in the future, right? Obviously, companies want this to gain competitive advantage, and then consumers are concerned about their privacy. So that's the, the sort of base case if we talk about publishing here, which types of publications are purchased, used, and cited, and which are most likely to be purchased, used, and cited in the future. So publishers and aggregators of content want to develop products that will do better in the market, and libraries want to acquire resources that will be used most or, um, by their users, um, or even predict what to acquire, what will be most used in the future. Researchers, though, may be concerned that the data is incomplete, allowing the wrong conclusions to be drawn, uh, and that data will be used to justify decisions that don't fairly represent their work. These are all things that Penny was alluding. Um, it's not just researchers who have the, those concerns in the bottom right cell of the table. Um, all of us who are invested in a healthy, functioning ecosystem for scholarly communication should be concerned about this. It's one thing for a grocery store to decide to offer more kale chips and stop offering quinoa chips because they're not popular, right? It's another thing for a university to increase support for, say, biomedical engineering over Southeast Asian studies. Now, it's inflammatory for me to play to fears of marginalization of the humanities in particular, um, but this does really get to questions about the mission of a university or, or a library. Um, do we always follow demand for the study of and research on certain topics, um, or do we support things for their inherent value without reference to the market because of their value to society? Um, I'm not going to try to resolve that tension today, but I'm going to take it as a given that we, we want the scholarly community to retain control over data related to publishing and be able to exert influence on how it's used. So how could we do this? <clears throat> I think we're going to need input and cooperation from all stakeholders in the system, libraries, publishers, research funders, uh, aggregators, etc. And we're going to need a neutral group uh, to take on this work. 
what, what sort of neutral group am I talking about here? So in the US, we have a NISO, the National Information Standards Organization. And um, while NISO has traditionally acted simply as a standards body, uh, maintaining the various Z dot standards you might have encountered if you're in libraries, um, they have moved into facilitating the establishment of, of what they call recommended practices for things related to, say, libraries and publishing. This is an example of one of those. Um, <clears throat> they've even got a new one of these recommended standards coming along related to privacy of human subject data in research data management. After all, the designers of data repositories are looking for best practices that will guide their handling of data. An organization like NISO could facilitate uh, the establishment of a code of conduct around predictive analytics related to publications, albeit primarily based in the US. Um, we want to be able to establish fair practices not just for libraries and scholarly societies, but also for commercial publishers, which have commercial motivations that don't necessarily align with the interests of individual researchers. So we might try to establish a consensus framework, such as this other recent activity from NISO. But how would you get the various stakeholders, especially commercial actors, to follow a code of conduct? <clears throat> you could have some sort of um, auditing process that ensures that they follow a code of conduct. Um, this is plausible for data that is shared between stakeholders, say, when a company called Academic Analytics sells data on research or productivity to institutions. Um, here are some examples of these kind of outside auditing uh, processes. Um, but we also want to prevent stakeholders from collecting and using certain kinds of data in the first place. After all, Academic Analytics isn't the only company providing data on research or productivity. Uh, Elsevier, for example, compiles um, publication data from all sorts of sources into a product called Simply Pure. Um, which institutions can buy access to, um, but you know, trust me, Elsevier isn't going to um, make other isn't uh, is going to make uses of, of the data that they gather, and they might even choose not to sell access to some of what they have, like, even just for themselves and for their own use. Um, so, before I explain the incentive, I want to make sure we all know what the term cooperative uh, that I use in the title is. A cooperative is an organization owned by its members, which produces some sort of benefit for them. They have a voice in the decisions of the organization, either by voting directly, perhaps at an in-person meeting, if this is just a local cooperative, or by electing members of a, of a board of directors. Um, some common types of co-ops are housing co-ops, where the residents collectively own the building rather than pay rent to a landlord. Food co-ops, which uh, acquires groceries and sells them to members without making a profit. And credit unions, a sort of bank owned by its uh, account holders. So what if we had a co-op organized around collecting and using data about publications? <clears throat> what if we formed a cooperative of libraries, scholarly societies, publishers, aggregators, and the other stakeholders that I've been talking about, who would contribute, who would each contribute to the governance of this member organization? What if the members contributed data that they create about scholarly communication, their little small view of the world, to this cooperative? And then the cooperative, thanks to member fees uh, had staff and tools to aggregate, normalize, and contextualize the data for its members, showing them how their data, their small view of the world, relates to that of all of the members, but in a way that adheres to a code of conduct agreed to by the members. Um, that's really the fourth point there, <clears throat> that they would agree to this code of conduct and how they use the data that they get back from the cooperative. Now, there's much to be worked out here. Perhaps these ideas are actually already premature uh, in, in maybe too, too, too specific about how this would work. Maybe it would be safer for me to say simply that a community of stakeholders would come together to jointly develop governance, sustainability, and ethical frameworks uh, for how data about publications is gathered, analyzed, and shared. I'd like to think that such a cooperative um, my collaborators and I have been calling this a Publishing Analytics Data Alliance, um, could be designed to provide something of value to even the largest commercial players, and that a shared governance model would ensure a continued community voice in how data about publications is gathered, analyzed, and used. It really does need to involve input from all the players. We can't just convene a group of experts to compose the whole model and then expect everyone to jump on board. Um, just kind of human nature, um, that if people and organizations don't feel invested in some collaboration from the start, it, it is unlikely to, to go anywhere. <clears throat> so um, while you can see that we have large ambitions, our idea has been to begin with something a bit more manageable, the data related to scholarly monographs. Um, we think, so not journals, um, 
and not other newer forms of, 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 um, of publishing. Um, we think the need here is the greatest and that um, the stakeholders are the most receptive to collaboration. Um, we have in mind a, a sort of three-year sort of pilot project that we, we call Project Meerkat, just for a catchy name, it doesn't really mean anything, um, to set up such a governance model and pilot infrastructure for monographs with the aim of, of spinning off, uh, that is developing at the end, a cooperative, this publishing analytics data alliance. But really, even before we do that, we, we think we need to do, conduct a fuller environmental scan of this rapidly developing world of publishing analytics. Because since 2015, as we've struggled to get this off the ground, a number of things have changed um, and, and in terms of what's going on out there. And so we, we want to make sure we, we do this right. So if you're interested in getting involved or simply in following the project, this is its home on the web for now. Uh, it includes contact information for our current team members. So we'd love to hear from you, especially if you think you're, um, you yourself or folks at your institution could donate some staff time to help getting this off the ground. So thank you very much for listening.